Hello and welcome to the Blueprint of the Universe series where we are looking at our sacred history and we are currently in the period of uh, Greece and we're looking at the ancient Greek mythology, the symbology behind it, how it came to be. Now we already looked at a very controversial topic as the origins of the Greek culture um, in our last videos where we discussed the theory of my firm belief that uh, the the Greek people already existed in that location as tribal forms after the fall of um, Crete and Gnosis, and then um, the Hyksos kings that were expelled from Egypt travelled uh, from Phoenicia um, and then into the Cyclades and then over into the mainland and began to um, cultivate the societies there and their children who were considered the sons of gods began to set up civilizations of their own all under the context of Greece which was in their eyes considered the rightful heir of the Egypt also which is why a lot of the names um, that we discussed in that video relate to um, supposed kings of Egypt even though they were in Greece and yeah, so what we implemented here was the exact same time frame when the mythology from the Titans, which were seen as um, very powerful um, natural forces made manifest into more human-like concepts such as Kronos, Nox, Gaia, um, Atlas. These were, these were massive um, elemental forces that explained key constructs and concepts within the universe, which is night and day, uh, time, um, and the, the world itself. And they were all ways of explaining as a tribal format. We saw this in different cultures, such as um, Native Americans using animals. Uh, ancient Egyptian tribal people used animals, which is why the heads of the gods were still existent then. Um, same with the Aztecs and uh, the, um, the Norse. All, all cultures began using elemental forces which either related to spirits of the universe, um, such as nymphs, that kind of thing, or animals, because animals were connected to the natural world. But over time, these individuals from Mesopotamia went out and spread their knowledge, and these gods became more um, human-like, more man-like, and less of the natural animal form. Sometimes amalgamating into the two, as we see, for example, the fish people, the men coming with knowledge, with the tales of fish from the sea, that kind of thing. And this continues on, because... They have the remnants of the Titans in such animals in mythology, such as uh, the Chimera, um, the Kraken, the uh, Medusa herself, those kind of things. And these were kind of amalgamations of the natural forces um, of the world. We have, um, you know, Hades' dog, uh, the three-headed dog. Um, and all these elements are um, a nod to natural forces in play being linked from the gods. But the gods themselves, when Cronus was defeated by his three sons, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, um, the twelve Olympians became the all-powerful. Uh, and this is a reenactment. It's a way of the Hyksos kings bringing their teachings and integrating it with the current... Um, uh, teachings and philosophies and stories of the native people in order to amalgamate this new system because the people saw them as, as rulers but we didn't want to see them as conquerors so they um, you know they came in just like the Egyptians did they're replaying the same story and it is a, a play on words really as well because a lot of the names are used um, what we're going to look at is how the Olympians we create, we've looked at how they, how they created, how they came into this location and then became the people they were. And yes, they were called gods, but equally the names of the gods were, had symbolic meaning. This is the same as the king making ritual, the court of the king in Egypt. It's the same thing. Um, and there is a name for this and it gets used all through time and it's called Pasha, where the names are effectively a symbolic play on words where they're used for multiple meanings on multiple cosmic levels. Um, and it's important to establish this now in this area because it's the base of what the rest of the Greek culture forms, which is why I want to discuss it now in this time period. So what I want to first look at is the three main heads of the Olympians, Hades, Zeus, and Poseidon. Now, 
there's a key element here that everybody seems to overlook and it's an extremely important one so we remember with Pasha and with shamanistic stories shame, part of shaman the shamanic culture and tradition is to pass on stories uh, sorry stories with elements of truth or symbolic um, philosophical meaning within them and so we have these high truths that have already been um, used in other cultures such as Egypt and um, now Phoenicia and Judaism because and Hebrewism because it's the same thing just told in a new way in a new culture because if you're trying to teach the same things to a new group of people that have their own language their own culture their own way of looking at the world you then just swap the meanings around to something they will understand and therefore be able to pass on and it's a massive historical context that people get really confused about especially modern day historians because they have no context about the true meaning of symbology so when they look at history they go oh well they're talking about this as well so they must have got it from them but no they were given it because it appeared in that culture beforehand because they migrated and moved into a new tribal area and then taught it in exactly the same way it was taught to them and that's why you have things like we're going to look later on in the future Odin is an exact direct um retelling of the story of Christ all the other way around and it happens again and again and again in every culture and it's the same story being passed on Zeus um, and Hades and Poseidon are taught within every culture now let's just look at this so there's one massive overlook and it's it's the details within these stories that have the greatest meaning now the three Olympians the three gods that came over which would have been the three brothers which as we already know when we look at um, Egyptian culture that would be uh, Osiris and Seth would be the main two brothers and then um, you have uh, I think it's the sister that's in between um, but that represents the middle ground but what we need to see is that each ruler or each god had a place within the universe which was heaven the top of olympia which was zeus we had the underworld which was hades and then poseidon of the sea ruled everything earth and sea remember he was the lord of horses and the sea not just the sea everyone forgets that so poseidon was actually ruler of everything in between the kingdom of man and it's the free middle ground the triangle of comparison night day and everything in between it's it's the way we always distinguish things in mathematics it's one two and three the triangle um, you have the first point uh, which is a point in space you have a second point which is a comparative opposite and then you have a third point which is any given point within between the two to create a point of comparison and that's how you make triangles which is the 3d space which is the world we live in um, today and so the three gods represent the three forms of the universe, the three extremes. Um, and it's light, dark, and in the middle, it's good, bad, and, and in the middle, it's um, heaven, earth, and, and the human realm. But what's more important is the tools that we carry. Now, Zeus's lightning bolt is a singular item. It's a single point item. Now, when you look at Hades, Hades is always drawn with a pitchfork, which has two points. And Poseidon has the famous trident of three points. So you have one, two, and three, the tools of the trade, the tools of the gods. Now, in the court of the king, each individual ruled part of the realm. So, just like Osiris was originally the king of the heavens, um, and Seth was the king of the underworld, it's the same for Hades and uh, Zeus and then obviously the kingdom of man was in the center which is Poseidon which is free so we play the same roles and it's that intellectual side of the heavens of the king making rituals so they look above and understand the knowledge and how the universe works and then try and pass it down to the people below whereas Hades represents the physical aspect the left hand path as it was the more practical sense of applying knowledge and learning through action and um, manifesting on, on the world. But then between the two of them, they create the middle ground where knowledge meets um, action, which is where Poseidon takes place, which is the third point. 
And between the three of them, that's what we're teaching. And this is also in the Kabbalah. It's in the Tree of Life, which is also passed on from um, the Hyksos, which were basically building the Tree of Life as well, which is a form of early Atonism, which then turns into Judaism, which is why the Phoenicians and Hyksos work so well with the Jews and the, um, the building of Jerusalem, because they use the same system, because it was passed on as an amalgamation between Hebrew and Egyptian, which is the Tarot. And it's this same story told, so that is the function of the three Olympians, the three things. It's taught to everybody. Everybody has an aspect of God. So in the Kabbalah, it's, it's angels, isn't it? It's angels and demons, and the demons represent the physical aspect side of things, the manifestation, which is towards Hades. Those angels represent the heaven side and the intellectual side, which is to do with um, Zeus and, and the actual application of it. The gods run the king represents uh, Poseidon um, as he implements the two on earth, which was King Solomon and King David, for example, and the Hyksos kings, the kings of Phoenicia, Tiram, Hiram of Tyr. And so it's the same story retold again and again. And these concepts, so when we look at the gods then, so we have the three major players, the three major artifacts, and then they separate out in aspects of children. And they all intermarry and have different roles, and they have children such as Ares, um, Athena, Apollo, Artemis, and they all play a different role within the court of the king. And that's because they're all given tasks, just like the pharaoh's gods were. That was the whole point. So the ruler, the main pharaoh, plays a role of each god, and each kind of kingdom's um, leader. So, for example, Argos might play the king of Argos might play a role within the court, which would be, you know, let's say, for example, Artemis or, or whatever. I'm just kind of spitballing this here. Um, but they will play that role. So when the king-making ritual appeared on Mount Olympus, they would get together and they would ascend the. Um, Pharaoh, the highest king, the Zeus, into the heavens, and his mind would elevate to see um, the universe and its great grand plan, and try and then bring that information back down to guide its people and plan out the rest of the culture of the kingdom in Greece. And it would then be given to each individual. So, for example, you know, um, the god that looks at war, so Ares would then go out and say, right, well, we need to expand in this area, so you need to um, go and um, whip your people up into a frenzy, we need to make weapons of war and send your people out here. And they would then come back in the next ritual, give their feedback to what's happened, and then that information can be used again in the next king-making ritual. It's a council, it's a court of a council, but it's used in a very different way um, mentally than we do use today. It's giving information, going out and using it, bringing back feedback, giving it to the king. The king then goes and uses the mind space to develop themselves, and then comes back with a new course of action for the next cycle. And that's what it is. It's a, it's a yearly cycle because it's 12 parts of the, the um, king-making ritual, 12 parts of the court, and each one plays a role within that time frame on Mount Olympus because it's the highest point possible, which, as we saw, could be the actual Mount Olympus or it could be um, the Tower of Babel, for example, that was being built just after that period of time. Uh, or it could be you know, the, the Kingdom of Solomon. So it's this it's multi-layered it's multi-faceted and that's why it becomes so complex and historians today have no concept about spirituality or symbolism or how it's used and therefore haven't got a fully informed decision when looking at the events of the times of society which is why these certain aspects can be missed such as the involvement of the Hyksos kings what the Olympians were for why mythology was created how it was used what secrets does it hold and without this soul of information the outside part doesn't really matter too much it's just a listing of events oh this person went here this person went there these ships conquered this location and it's like that doesn't mean anything we need to look at why what is the ultimate goal and reasoning behind it the soul the spirit of it which is what the three also represent the spirit the mind and the hand effectively the body so you have um yeah, the, the, the three parts. And say we have the other kings and courts roles to represent other parts within the system as well. 
So later on, what we need to establish is the role of the demigod, for example. So we have people like Hercules, Achilles, um, Perseus, who are all sons of gods. And there's females as well, like Io, for example. And they are all very important because it sets a precedent. Now, their concept of the sons of gods are those married or born in from the bloodline of the Hyksos, who are the Olympians, and the common folk of those not of the Hyksos, which were the tribal leaders of the time. Because just like all pharaohs were trying to keep the bloodlines as pure as possible, but you get those that are mixed. And part of the culture, so part Greek and part Hyksos. And it's important to note that because the Son of God represents that. That's what it means. It's the Son of God, the bloodlines of God, which are the gods of the Olympians, which are the Hyksos, which are the pharaohs. But it also means they are connected to these higher abilities. They are able to access the higher mind space, these higher genetic points of being able to develop one's mind to attain, use the mind space, use the king-making ritual and, and be part of the court. And that's why they're considered higher above normal people, but lower than Olympians, because they're not purely part of the court or the king, but they're less, uh, but they're more than normal people because they have this ability um, within them, but also this blood right. But that's what Jesus, the Son of God, also meant. It's the same context. He was a demigod, a a member who carries the bloodline of the pharaohs and we'll look at that later on but it's precedent to that because the son of god is not a new concept and when we think about it in in christianity we think oh it's the son of god there's only one and he's 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 the son of the almighty that's fine but we have a precedent we have the son of the god in greece which are the, the demigods which are the bloodline shared by the people um, from the Hyksos and the Pharaohs. And so we see how it all comes together. So symbology and Pasha, or the, the art of Pasha, is extremely important. Um, and without that, we can't get a true understanding of what happens. So we've had a very brief, and now this is, we could go on about this topic in so much detail, in just infinite depth. Um, and there's a lot more of this in my book, How a Sacred History Part 1, which details this concept of Greek uh, mythology and how it's worked. But I equally go, if you look at um, the other book, Our Sacred Knowledge, I go through all the points of the Tree of Life and the Kabbalah and the steps of the blueprint of the universe and how each of the ten steps represent part of the Olympian um gods and, and how that was created as well so you know there's a lot more information on the book series uh, that we can put into one single video but we've looked at how creatures within mythology uh, greek mythology were created how the olympians were created why they were what they really represent and how they're used to purvey knowledge because remember the other thing we need to mention is as well the concept of the gods and praying is a completely different context to what we think as well because again we have christianity and modern religions such as um, islam for example where praying isn't actually what it really is or what it was meant to be used for back in the day so but because we're so used to the new modern context of praying and what we think praying is that we don't realize that when the egyptians pray or when the greeks prayed it was a completely different concept to what we think it was today and therefore we have no ability to understand it uh, because we just think it's the same religion as we use today but praying for them was different because there was this link now they the people knew that the gods existed because they always said so and it wasn't a flight of fancy it was because these people did exist in this court of the king from the hyksos people and these roles were continued on through generations by the rulers of their people and they sat relatively removed from uh, the culture, which is why we always have this thing of, oh, the gods aren't interacting, by, you know, and then the, there's the rule where the gods aren't meant to interact with the um, world of mortal men and this kind of thing. It's all true because that's how it was. But we just assume they mean these higher powers. Now, they do mean the higher powers, but they also mean the people. But they also mean the archetypal roles within each individual because every individual can relate to the gods or an aspect of the god every individual can be really linked and i always use the idea of aries because it's most common um and 
every man or woman can become aggressive. They can prepare for war. They can set to defend themselves. They can be actively changing the world around them. And by praying to Ares, they fulfill that role themselves. They play that role. They become an Ares-type figure where they're readying for war and preparing themselves. And it's just a way of changing yourself mentally and becoming that energy in order to make manifest a change within the world around you you're not going to think about nice things and the sun and apollo if you're going out to commit atrocities you'll need to get ready and to get your blood hunger going and um, become warlike and that's why armies would pray to Ares before they went to war um, because they need to get in that mind frame to be both as a group but also an individual ready to attain that task it's the same when the Egyptians went to war they would call on Seth to guide them maybe the individual themselves because Seth was the king's brother who was very warlike and in charge of tactics and expanding the kingdom and defence so they would maybe bring him with them but equally each one of them would take on an aspect of Seth within themselves to become warlike and fulfil their role in that current time and that's what the gods used in Greece. So when they prayed and went to the temple, they were filling themselves up with those individuals. That's why sailors would worship Poseidon on the sea, because they wanted to become the master of the sea um, and be better sailors. And then when they got home, they would pray and give thanks, and then they would go to a different temple that would suit whatever it is, uh, Hermes for trade, if they you know, want the goods. So now they would pray to Hermes to understand trade better, to put themselves in the trade mindset, to go to the market to achieve the best price. So we would use the gods and the temples and offerings as a way of mentally triggering different psychological archetypes. That's how it really was, that's what it's for. Because these gods, these fragments, represent parts of us, but equally are manifested in more pure forms within these leaders to manage the country. Just like we have the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Immigration, the Secretary of Economics, the Military Secretary um, in England. These individuals are pure forms of things everybody can be, but they're just there to manage it on a, a country level. But then equally there is the context of all war in all the world, which would be the Aries or the Secretary of, of war within the world and that's the energy within it that could be you know the god as such which we describe as these higher level beings but equally number five is the same as Aries which is to do with war and god but it's all to do with energy change physical change external change active change fire um, brutality you know all, all these kind of things because heat creates higher um, chemical changes and um, um, activity which creates more um, states of change within different chemicals and, and the world around us and the volatility which is what Aries is in the universe it's the elemental form of Aries and so it can be applied multifaceted to every level but equally it's also an individual and it's also us and it's our mindset and we can use this for every god, and it's the same teachings that have been taught by the Egyptians. It's just amalgamated into different names, different teachings, which is why the Romans then use the same context with different names later on down the line, and so on and so on. And then we use it as angels and demons and everything else. So this is an extremely important lesson because it gives us a foundation for the Greek community because later on when they become more um, intellectual and more scholarly and more philosophical they still acknowledge these contexts but they begin to explain them and analyze them in new ways so they just change the language into what we call modern day science and it's built on mathematics and a vibrational layer of understanding and you know we have energy in physics we have opposing forces in Einstein's theory of relativity we have um, uh, the ideas of um, emotions and psychology within Athena it, it, it's just a reinterpretation a relabeling and a restructuring and a re um, kind of expanding out into these areas to make it more modern 
um, and that's what they try to do and that's where it all comes from but it actually signifies as well the break between the right and the left hand path which we'll see later on which is uh, part of the concept of Zeus and Hades so I hope you've enjoyed there's a lot going on there but it establishes some certain truths such as the bloodlines the true origins of the Olympians the use of the king line the king making ritual within a new culture the birth of Greek civilization because what we're going to look at next is um, what happens with this information uh, during the period of the war of Troy we've looked at kind of what happened to Troy and we're going to look at what post that events in Greece now and what happens to this information as it continues on through history and these points raised are extremely important in establishing that so we'll look at that next in our next video so i hope you've enjoyed i hope that's answered some questions i hope it's given you more questions as well about the situation and um, yeah i hope to see you soon so please like subscribe and follow and if you can pick up a copy of our book to get a jump on the next part of the series thank you very much goodbye Hello and welcome to the Blueprint of the Universe series where we are looking at our sacred history and we are currently in the period of uh, Greece and we're looking at the ancient Greek mythology, the symbology behind it, how it came to be.